So Helen Welkin drew his NPTEL course entitled Feminist Writings, where we'll begin with the poem Goblin Market today uh, by Christiana Rossetti. So we have already had one introductory essay on this poem where we talked about the um, a basic summary of the poem and also talked about the bi background of the poem in terms of the biographical background, the cultural background, uh, the cultural context which informs this poem. So we'll dive into the text today and we'll see how it's a very important example of a text which may have been written with a different kind of intention in mind. Uh, so the authorial intention may have been completely different, but the way it has emerged, evolved and been interpreted uh, you know, across time is interesting because today it is seen as a very strong feminist text, a very strong feminist uh, critique of capitalism, consumerism and very male-centered mercantile economy. Uh, and as I may have mentioned already in the, po in the beginning, of the, where we're doing the summary on the introduction to the poem, uh, it's interesting to see how the erotic economy of the poem and the um, economic economy, I mean the, the financial economy of the poem, are mapped onto each other and they're both controlled by men and uh, sort of question of ownership, agency, identity, uh, sexual ownership, you know, agency, identity becomes very, very important in the poem. Uh, and to what extent does a poem emerge as a poem of resistance, female resistance against uh, male exploitation, whether it's financial exploitation or sexual exploitation? Uh, so the question of agency keeps coming up in the poem, uh, you know, you know if, if you read the text carefully. And in keeping with the rest of the text that we have in this course, it's interesting to see how the discursive context in the poem and experiential context of the poem, they merge with each other. So. Uh, the description of corruption, decadent sexual exploitation, uh, you know, the whole idea of uh, having a death-like experience, uh, that's all very closely in correspondence to the discursive economy of the poem, you know, the entire idea of capitalism, consumerism, uh, unprincipled capitalism, uh, and dangerous consumption, or dangerous consumerism, and how that, you know, leads on to a pathological condition is something that we will see in the poem. Now let's dive into the text and see how it emerges as a very strong feminist piece of writing. So this is Goblin Market by Cristiano Rossetti. Morning and evening, maids heard the goblins cry, come buy our orchard fruits, come buy, come buy. Apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plump unpecked cherries, melons and raspberries, bloom down to cheek peaches, swart headed mulberries wild freeborn cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather, morns that pass by, fair eaves of fly, come by, come by. Our grapes fresh from the vine, pomegranates full and fine, dates and sharp bullaces, rare pears and green gauges, damsons and bilberries, taste them and try, currants and gooseberries, bright fire like barberries, Fix to fill them out, citrons from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye, come by, come by. So at the very beginning, the very opening stanza of the poem, it gives a list of the different kind of fruits which uh, appear in the market. And there's a sense of a sing-song quality about this opening, so it's like you know, vendors singing out their merchandise um, in a bit to seduce the consumer. Uh, inviting the consumer to come and partake of the commodity, come and partake of what they brought in the market. Uh, and if you take a look at the different fruits which are listed in the poem, uh, a large part, you know, a large number of these uh, fruits, they, they happen to come from the, uh, the colonies. They're Australian fruits, they're Asian fruits, they're African fruits, and there are some domestic fruits as well. So th the tropical quality of the fruits is important for us to understand. Uh, because it's a very important, interesting combination of domestic uh, goods, domestic commodities, as well as unfamiliar commodities, exotic commodities. And when we read this poem carefully, we need to pay attention to the entire uh, speciality of the market. So what kind of space is the market uh, in contrast to the home? And this is something I may have touched uh, on already when we re read the introduction of the poem. So the market is a, is a temporal place. It's a place where you know, things are created and generated uh, for the time being. Uh, there's not a permanent quality about the market, it's, it's something which is produced ad hoc. It's something which is metonymic in quality, uh, different things come in together and produce and generate an economy of exchange. And it's an interesting combination of the familiar and the unfamiliar, between the homely and the unhomely. So there's also, especially in a market like this, uh, there's also a degree of uncanny about the market. So it's uncanny quality about the market is something which we pay a lot of attention to. And when we use the word uncanny, we are obviously drawing on Freud's idea of uncanny, which is unheimlich, which literally means unhomely, outside the home, right? So 
uh, the quality of the fruits, uh, the fruits coming from different parts of the world, some of the, most of the fruits are unfamiliar. Uh, they, you know, come from different, you know, tropical places, colonial places, and that obviously becomes a bit of an exhibition of the empire uh, to a certain extent, um, the emerging empire uh, to a certain extent. Uh, so the British merchandise, you know, which was importing the British economy, which was importing uh, different objects from across the world. And this market becomes, this goblin market becomes a very metonymic uh, marker for that kind of exhibition, that kind of consumption. And as we have seen already, if we take a look at the illustrations, if you remember the illustrations which you used in the previous lecture, we see quite clearly that goblins, the way they're represented, uh, is often, uh, it's very, very non-human. There's a degree of, uh, you know, rodent-like quality about them. Uh, there's a degree of non-anthropomorphic quality about them, and that non-humanness or that non-anthropomorphic quality is what makes them dangerous, is what, m what makes them uh, unhomely or uncanny in quality. In contrast, of course, with the very white, pristine, virgin quality of the woman, uh, the British woman in this poem. So this idea of the dangerous male outsider, which is embodied by the merchants, and it's very, the idea of the dangerous male space, which is um, embodied by the market, the goblin market, is interesting. There's a nice correlation, a complex correlation between the male, dangerous male outsider and the dangerous male market, and how both consume and invade uh, female purity, uh, female agency, uh, and female sexuality. And again, we're coming back to this very interesting combination of a uh, very interesting issue looking at female sexuality and female agency together as one entity, as one experience. So the whole idea of owning your sexuality, the whole idea of owning your body, the whole idea of owning your agency, uh, you know, that produces the related qualities of identity, uh, the related qualities of, you know, ownership, the related qualities of, uh, you know, the broader narrative of agency. And how that agency gets corrupted uh, with the arrival of the market, how that uh, idea of ownership on your own body, ownership on your own sexuality gets corrupted, or gets problematized at least, with the arrival of the market. And how we have two figures, two uh, female figures in the poem, Laura and Lizzie. Uh, Laura becomes vulnerable, Laura becomes prey uh, to this male invasion of female, uh, you know, sexuality or agency, whereas Lizzie goes to the market and recovers and retrieves the agency with a very symbolic penny, with a very symbolic coin, which, with which she, uh, you know, uh, you know, articulates the resistance, articulates, uh, uh, you know, whole idea of sustaining uh, the female agency. But before we come to that, we need to pay attention to how this marketplace is constructed. Uh, it's almost like a list down, uh, a drop down menu of different objects which are available in the market. So apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plum, unpecked cherries, melons and raspberries. So you have a list of uh, fruits which are quite exotic in quality, a list of tastes which are very exotic in quality. And there is a degree of tactility about this market and you can almost touch the fruits. Uh, you know, it's very fleshy in quality and again that is a very interesting example of how the erotic economy of the poem and the uh, financial economy are mapped onto each other. Uh, so we have bloomed down, checked uh, peaches, swart headed mulberries, wild freeborn cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather. So again, the whole idea of summer weather is um, it may be an allusion to the tropics, an allusion to warmer places on the planet, uh, definitely not Britain. So it all comes from summer weather. It all comes from places where it is about fertility and summer quality and warmth. And that becomes part of the advertisement uh, in this particular market. And also, we need to pay attention to the fact that the cultural context of this poem is important because this is also the birth of the advertisement industry as we know it today. So the whole idea of advertising commodities, the whole idea of um, exoticizing commodities, uh, was screaming out the names, was screaming out the locales where they come from, screaming out the very uh, fancy attributes which they carry, is all part of the um, uh, emerging advertisement industry in Britain at that point of time. And of course, the advertisement industry in Britain at that point of time is in very close correspondence to the entire idea of the imperial economy, uh, because a lot of these commodities come from different parts of the emerging empire, uh, where Britain is about to have more and more, not just economy, but also military control uh, and colonial control subsequently. So, uh, and with the birth of the advertisement industry, it was also interesting to see how, uh, among the many readings the poem offers, is also reading of the danger of um, contaminated consumption. Uh, so what do I mean when I say uh, contaminated consumption? The idea of unchecked consumption, the idea of unprincipled capitalism, which brings in all kinds of fruits, all kinds of commodities, all kinds of objects, 
in a bit to sail them. Uh, and there's no quality control, there's no idea of safety and security of the commodity. And that becomes uh, a danger, that becomes a danger to the consumer. So the whole idea of contaminated consumption becomes a very important issue in this poem. So one can read, one can apply very strong Marxist readings in the poem, one can apply very strong you know, sexual psychoanalytic readings of the poem, but also I mean, both is combined to you know, produce this very rich feminist writing or feminist reading that we will hopefully achieve, we will hopefully arrive at by the time we end this poem. So the whole idea of all these fruits being ripe together in summer weather, uh, months have passed by, fair eaves of fly, come by, come by. So you know, the whole idea, the refrain of seducing the consumer, come by, come by, come partake of fruit, come taste of fruit, uh, you know, this is very exotic fruits from different parts of the world. It's something which uh, the almost, uh, you know, uh, the, the enchanting uh, incantation with which the poem opens is obviously the cry of the merchants uh, seducing the, um, the consumer, the naive consumer, uh, the, in, the innocuous consumer, right? So, uh, so the poem has a lot of uh, covert caveats, you know, so, you know, it's a caveat against um, you know, contaminated consumption. There's a, there's a caveat against uh, you know, the dangers of unchecked and unprincipled capitalism and unprincipled commodity production, etc. as we will see as we move on and read the poem. So, um, so we have citrons from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye. So again, the, it's a very sensuous kind of a market. So you can, all kinds of senses are invoked. Sweet to the tongue, you can taste them. Sound to the eye, and there's a tactile quality about it as well. And come by, come by, as a refrain which keeps coming back throughout the poem. So we have at the very beginning, at the very outset of the poem, we have a list of the different commodities, the different objects, which inhabit this market. And the objects are quite exotic in quality. The objects are quite uh, foreign in quality. And this foreign exotic quality of the objects, something which is deliberately underlined at the beginning of the poem, because you know. Like I said, a bazaar uh, or a market of this quality is a very interesting entanglement or an asymmetric entanglement between the known and the unknown, between the homely and the unhomely, uh, between what is familiar and what is unfamiliar. Right? So it's a whole idea of packaging the unfamiliar, the whole idea of packaging and producing the unfamiliar for consumption, which is with the, the principle with which a market like this works. And the whole idea of production and consumption is very really ad hoc in quality in a market like this. Okay, so that's the setting, that's the spatial setting with which the poem opens. And as we may have guessed by now, that you know, most of the texts that we study in this course, uh, space becomes a very important issue. Uh, because space is very closely related to agency, uh, space is very closely related to production, consumption, uh, identity production, and identity consumption as well. And also, very interestingly, uh, space has a very interesting relationship with commodity and objects. So the whole idea of uh, what an object is uh, depends on its location in a particular space. If you divorce the location, if you decontextualize that, then obviously the objectivity, the value of the object will be you know, problematized, will be altered significantly. Right? So that idea of uh, locating the object in a particular space becomes very important, and that's something which we see throughout this course and as we move on and uh, study the text that we have. Okay, so, um, and now we have obviously the introduction of one of the protagonists in the poem, Laura, is one of the poems, one of the sisters who, who appear in this poem. Uh, evening by evening, among the uh, brookside rushes, Laura bowed her head to hear, Lizzie veiled her blushes. Uh, crouching to get close together in the cooling weather, with clasping arms and cautioning lips, with tingling cheeks and fingertips. Lie close, Laura said pricking up the golden head. We must not look at goblin men. We must not buy the fruits. Um, you know, who knows upon what soil to feed the hungry, thirsty roots. Come by, call the goblins, hobbling down the glen. glen. So the whole idea, the whole voice of caution is very interestingly uh, conveyed in this poem. And, and also look at the space, the whole idea, the recurrence of space as a metaphor of identity, as an, um, something which determines identity, as something which determines uh, safe identity as well as uh, unsafe and dangerous identity, something which we see in the poem. So the two sisters crouch close together. And again, the relationship between the two sisters uh, is very interesting over here. It's never quite clear what kind of sisterhood is being hinted at over here. Is it a sense of biological kinship? Are they blood sisters? Or is an erotic economy at play over here as well? That's not quite, uh, it's never really spelled out for us. But obviously, there's a lot of intimacy. Uh, between the two sisters, uh, a lot of love and affection and bonding uh, between the two sisters, which you see in the poem. And we have the whole idea of clasping arms and cautioning lips, 
with tingling cheek and fingertips. Lie close, Laura said, pricking up a golden head. We must not look at goblin men. We must not buy the fruits. Who knows upon what soil the feed the fed the hungry, thirsty roots. So again, the whole idea of not knowing where they come from, uh, not knowing the source of origin, uh, is something which is uh, you know, voiced in the poem as a word of caution, as a voice of caution, and a caveat against this kind of a contaminated consumption. Come by, call the goblins, hobbling down the glen. So again, if you look at the movement of the goblins, it's almost animal-like in quality, hobbling down the glen. The goblins are hobbling down the glen. So obviously, there's a lot of sound play over here. Um, which is onomatopoeic in quality, but what is that also suggestive of is an almost animal-like movement of the goblins. Uh, so one is reminded of, for instance, the, the rats in the Pied Piper Hamelin, uh, the rats which come in from, you know, and infest the whole place and pollute the whole place. So a sense of pollution, contamination, uh, contamination of culture, contamination of sexuality, contamination of economy, they all merge together in this poem in very interesting and complex combinations. Oh, cried Lizzie, Laura, Laura, you should not peep at goblin men. Lizzie covered up her eyes, covered clothes, lest they should look. Laura read her glossy head and whispered like the restless brook. Look, Lizzie, look, Lizzie, down the glen tramp little men. One holds the basket, one bears a plate, one locks a golden dish of many pounds weight. How fair the vine must grow, whose grapes are so luscious. How warm and the wind must blow through those fruit bushes. No, said Lizzie, no, 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 the offers do not charm us. The evil gifts would harm us. She thrust a dimpled finger in each ear, shut eyes, and ran. Curious Laura chose to linger, wondering at each merchant man. Now, uh, so we can see a bifurcation uh, operative over here. So uh, Lizzie, obviously, is a more uh, wise sister, is a more careful and cautious sister. She's on her guard, and she's aware of the fact that this goblin man can come from somewhat dangerous and the goods, the commodities that they carry uh, could also be contaminated in quality. And she's advising her sister not to look at them, not to pay any attention to the very seductive cries of, um, you know, purchase. Uh, and then, you know, she says quite clearly that, you know, the office should not charm us, their evil gifts would harm us. So, you know, it's very charming, it's very seductive, but then it's also quite uh, dangerous in quality. And this danger is something which is hinted at throughout the poem, and it's quite clearly suggested that the evil gifts would harm us. Uh, and then she said, you know, we, we get to know that she thrust a dimple finger in each ear, shut eyes and ran. Uh, but then that's one movement. And so Lizzie runs away. Lizzie is careful. Lizzie is very cautious. Um, and she keep, wants to keep herself safe against this contamination, this possibility, the potential contamination of the goblin men. But in contrast to that, we have Laura, uh, who chose to linger. Now, this verb is very interesting, linger. So linger obviously means, uh, you know, you're dwelling on something. You're uh, essentially sitting on the fence. Uh, it's a degree, of, a degree of ambivalence about linger, a degree of liminality about linger. So you, you're in a threshold position between two zones, uh, between yes and no, between, uh, you know, acceptance and rejection. So lingering somewhere, uh, dwelling somewhere, uh, is suggestive of an activity in ambivalence. And this ambivalence uh, very quickly becomes acceptance, very quickly becomes, uh, you know, part of the seduction strategy of the goblins. And uh, Laura obviously gets seduced by the goblins in, in the sense that she goes in the market and she partakes of this goblin fruit, she partakes of this goblin commodity. And in the process, uh, her contamination happens biologically, medically, sexually, existentially, in all sense of the term. But so we have, we have a sense of that ha beginning to happen when Laura, uh, you know, when you know, she, she chose to linger and she chose to go to the goblin market and she's um, evidently seduced, she's evidently curious uh, the look of the goblin men and the merchandise that they brought in. Now, at this point, let's take a look at the description of the goblin men and how non-anthropomorphic that is in quality, how non-human that is in quality. And this non-human quality is part of the uncanny uh, uh, quality of the goblin men, the fact that they are unhomely, uh, they are not something which we see on a daily basis. Um, their existence outside uh, the everyday reality is something which gives them a menace in quality. So the menace of the men uh, is due to, you know, is part of the process of, you know, uncanny, part of the production of uncanny that they have either with their embodiment as, you know, half human, half animals, or with the extended embodiment, which is the, the commodity. So the commodities are very important over here because they are very much a part of the extended embodiment of the goblin men. 
Now, let's take a look at the description, the, the physiognomy features of the goblin man and how that becomes part of the uncanny package that we just uh, discussed. So, curious Laura chose to linger, uh, wondering at each merchant man. One had a cat's face, one whisked a tail. One tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail. One like a warm cat, prowled obtuse and furry. One like a rattle, tumbled, hurry, scurry. She heard a voice like voice of doves, cooing all together. The sound of kind and full of love. So, what is interesting to see is this interesting, very complex combination of domestic, uh, familiar, uh, you know, recognizable metaphors of peace and nicety and goodness, along with uh, very dangerous, uh, you know, suggestions, very dangerous, uh, you know, hints and insinuations. And what that combination does is that it gives you a sense of defamiliarization. So the whole idea of the goblin men gets defamiliarized. So uh, they are half human, half animals. Um, they seem to be full of love. They seem to have a voice of dove, but at the same time, they have cat's whiskers. They have a um, cat's face. Someone uh, has a tail. Someone walks at a rat's pace. Someone crawls like a snail. So none of these features, none of these movements, none of these anatomical uh, you know, features or attributes are human in quality. And at the same time, we have the voice of doves queeing all together. The sound of kind and full of love. So you know the whole idea of doves and love, you know, is suggestive of peacefulness and harmony. And that is very carefully com combined with you know these metaphors of uh, menace to a certain extent. So these metaphors of menace become very very important in quality. And what that does together is that it gives you a sense of deceptive uh, domesticity. And this idea of deceptive domesticity is important because that's what uh, seduces Laura. Uh, she thinks that she is, uh, you know, in control. She thinks that she can go for these men's, uh, uh, you know, strategies and invitations, and then in the process, she becomes prey to this, and she becomes harmed uh, by this whole idea of seduction that the goblin men produce with the um, economy of merchandise. Okay. So it all sounded very nice and lovely in this pleasant weather. Laura stretched her gleaming neck like a rush-embedded swan like a lily from the beck, like a moonlit poplar branch, like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone. Now, if you take a look at these metaphors, if you take a look at these descriptions, uh, these are descriptions of purity, descriptions of domesticity, descriptions of an idyllic life. So Laura stretched her gleaming neck like a rush-embedded swan. So, you know, the whole idea of a swan, uh, as an example, is normally a metaphor of purity, majesty, uh, something which is uh, very comfortably embedded in the, in the folds of nature, etc. Like a lily from a beck, like a moonlit poplar branch. Again, lily, uh, moonlit poplar branch. Again, these are very idyllic natural metaphors and natural signifiers, or signifiers of an idyllic nature. Like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone. Now, this last bit is interesting because what that is suggested of the fact is of the fact that you know this she is behaving or she is very quickly becoming like a vessel, like a ship when its last restraint is gone. So when it's about to sail off without any anchor, without any root. And the whole idea of losing the root, losing the anchor becomes interesting because Laura is about to step into a territory which is dangerous, so essentially deterritorialized. And this whole idea of deterritorializing uh, the known landscape with the arrival of the market is something which is very spatially done. So the known landscape, the familiar landscape, is very dramatically deterritorialized and defamiliarized. De with the arrival of the market. So the defamiliarization and deterritorialization is in very close correspondence with the production of the market, the ad hoc presence of the market. Right? And this ad hoc quality of the market becomes interesting in quality because that is also suggested with the fact that that's also the reason why Laura's last restraint is gone. So the restraint in terms of having ownership on herself, having ownership of her own rational self, uh, is beginning to disappear, and she is quite clearly and evidently being seduced by the goblin market, by the arrival of the goblin men. Okay, and now we see how this movement, uh, uh, how we get an insight into the workings and the mechanisms of the market. Backwards up the mossy glen, turn and trooped the goblin men. So again, if you look at the verbs in play, we are turn and trooped, it's like an army of men, a troop of men coming in from the outside. So there is a sense of invasion about the arrival of the market, the arrival of the men. And what is being invaded is, among other things, the mossy glen, the idyllic landscape, uh, which is obviously a signify of purity and innocence and naivete uh, and, and idyllic nature. That is being invaded by the arrival of the goblin men who come in as a troop, as an army of invaders. With a shrill repeated cry, come by, come by, 
when they reached where Laura was, they stood stuck upon, stood upon the moss, leering at each other. So again, leering is a very dirty gaze. Uh, it's a form of gaze which is normally um, associated with a negative quality, a negative decadent quality. Leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signaling each other, brother with sly brother. One set his basket down, one read his plate, one began to weave a crown of tendrils, leaves, and rough knots brown. Men sell not such in any town. One heaved the golden weight of dish and fruit to offer up. Come by, come by, was still the cry. So if you look at the adjectives, queer, sly, uh, these are very negative adjectives. Uh, so queer, obviously, always, I mean, strange, and that's part of the uncanny package that we're talking about from the, you know, since the beginning of the poem. It's outside the home. It's some of the, the market is a public space which is outside the home, and the market is uh, an example of deterritorialization as well as defamiliarization, uh, and that becomes part of the uncanny, uh, the production of the uncanny, as it were. Now, brother with sly brother, uh, brother with queer brother, signaling to each other. So these are very negative markers of negativity, markers of menace, in a way. And this markers of menace is what um, market begins to create. And that's where Laura enters and begins uh, to consume this menace, begins to consume this uh, you know, whole idea of uncanny that this market has brought in. And uh, what well, they tell her, obviously, they ask her to come and partake of the fruit. They come and ask her to consume the fruit. Come by, come by, was still the cry. Uh, and we are told before that, men sell not such in any town. Uh, so this is not something which you find in any town. This is something which comes from outside. So the merchandise they brought in, uh, tendrils, leaves, and rough nuts brown, we are told that men sell not such in any town. So these nuts and leaves and tendrils, uh, they obviously come from somewhere else. And that somewhere else is interesting because somewhere else is indicative of an exotic locale uh, from the outside, outside the known parameter, outside the known territory uh, of and recognition and culture and all the rest of it. So you know, it's something which is outside. And that outside quality is part of the menace quality, part of the menace marker in the poem. right? So come by, come by, was still the cry. Laura stared but did not stir. Long but had no money. So Laura is obviously getting seduced. Laura stared but not stirred. So she is fixating that position. She is staring at the merchandise. She is staring at the men. And she's obviously curious and seduced by the st strangeness of the merchandise, the strangeness of this man. Uh, longed but had no money. She was, she was desirous of partaking the commodity. She was desirous of consuming the commodity, but she had no money. And this is the beginning of the, the, the point of the poem where the whole idea of the erotic economy and the financial economy are mapped into each other and how one become replaceable with the other. Long but no, had no money. The whisk-tailed merchant bade her taste in tones as smooth as honey. The cat face purred, the rat face spoke a word. So cat face, rat face, uh, the whisk-tailed, all very animal metaphors, all very metonymically animal metaphors and that becomes part of the menace quality of the, of the or goblin men over here. Uh, the mark is a menace, as it were. Uh, the rat face spoke a word of welcome, and the snail pace even was heard. One parrot voice and jolly cried, pretty goblin, and still for pretty Polly, one whistled like a bird. So none of these movements, none of these voices are human in quality, and that non-humanness becomes, as I mentioned, part of the uncanny menace. But sweet tooth Laura spoke in haste, good folk, I have no coin to take word to purloin. I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either, and all my gold is on the face that shakes in, in windy weather. Now, this is a bit where we know that, you know, what she tells him quite clearly that I have no coin, and if I were to buy without a coin, if I were to buy without paying for anything, it'll be purloin, it'll be uh, stealing, theft. So the only money I have, the only wealth I have is what uh, the furs, the shakes in the windy weather. And that is, she's alluding obviously to her golden locks of hair. And the golden locks of hair obviously become markers of her sexuality, markers of her sexual embodiment. Uh, so she says the only wealth I have at the moment is my sexuality, the only wealth I have at the moment is my body, my sexualized body. And that, you know, the lock of hair, the golden lock of hair becomes a mark that becomes a signifier of that wealth, of that uh, you know, asset, as it were. Uh, so it's a very interesting, uh, perhaps a perverse reading of asset in a different way. So it's not really a financial asset, but it's also an asset of, you know, uh, which belongs to her in terms of a sexualized ownership. And obviously she offers that, as you see in the poem, she offers that in exchange of the fruit. Uh, so that can also be seen as a metaphor, as an allegory of prostitution, that she offers a sexuality in return of a certain kind of uh, 
pleasure, so the kind of uh, contaminated consumption. So three to Laura spoken haste, good folk, I have no coin to take wood to purloin. So you know, it will be theft if I don't pay for what uh, I purchase. I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either. And all my gold is on the first that shakes in windy weather. So the whole idea of the female not possessing money, the female possessing only her sexuality, is a very interesting and a very crude binary which was prevalent at that point in time. That binary is critiqued in the poem. Uh, um, and with these situations, with the scenes where Laura tells them quite clearly that, you know, I just have my sexualized body and you know, I don't have any penny, I don't possess any money, so that's the only thing I can offer you. Uh, you have much gold upon your head, and that's the response from the goblin men that you possess a lot of gold upon your head. Uh, your hair is gold, and obviously, as I mentioned, the hair becomes the metonymic marker of a sexuality, of a sexualized, uh, you know, female identity. They answer all together, so, you know, it's almost like a chorus response, a choric response to a question. So they all say, you know, you have a lot of gold on your hair. Buy from us with a golden curl. So, you know, this is the exchange that is established in the poem at this point of time. So give us a golden curl, buy from us with a golden curl, and we'll give you our commodity, we'll give you our fruit in exchange of a golden curl from your head. She's, she clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl, then sucked the fruit globes fair or red. So, you know, and she enters into that exchange. She enters into that established exchange where she clips, um, uh, you know, a precious golden lock, a precious golden hair, and in exchange for a fruit, exchange of a forbidden fruit. So, you know, that, that idea of consuming forbidden fruit that brings in a biblical story away, yeah, the biblical story of seduction and temptation and, you know, of disobedience and the replications, the fallout that happens out of it. But, you know, Obviously, this is quite allegorical as well. So we talked about how, you know, uh, you know, Rossetti, when she was writing the poem, uh, she was working. She had worked before uh, in a, you know, in a reformation and rehabilitation clinic of pro prostitutes. Her experience of prostitutes informs this poem quite heavily. So the whole idea of Laura offering golden hair in exchange of a fruit. Uh, becomes quite, you know, interestingly an allegory of prostitution, an allegory of female disempowerment. So she gives in to the seduction of the men with her sexualized uh, body and that, that, that golden curl becomes the metonymic marker for that kind of uh, sexualized body. And she sucked the golden fruits, the fruit globes fair or red, sweeter than honey from the rock, stronger than man rejoicing wine, clearer than water flowed that juice, she never tasted such before. So this is something that she never tasted before, she never had that before. So again, the whole idea of something which is new and exotic and forbidden and uh, fascinatingly foreign, uh, but at the same time menacing and dangerous and contaminated in quality, that comes back at this point in the poem. Uh, how could she cloy with length of use? She sucked and sucked and sucked the mow, the fruits which that unknown orchard bow. Uh, she sucked until her lips were so. So the whole idea of sucking, the, the fact that you know, the word sucked comes thrice over here, uh, you know, it almost gives a sense of intoxication, a sense of you know, addiction, that she is completely addicted, she's completely intoxicated you know, the, in partaking of that kind of flavor, that kind of taste. And that intoxication, that seduction becomes uh, part of the uh, fallen woman uh, narrative in the poem. She, she sucked until her lips were so, then flung the emptied rinse away, but gathered up one kernel stone, and knew not it was night or day, as she turned home alone. So the last bit is very, very important because she sucked and sucked, and, and the whole idea of getting into, getting some kind of forbidden pleasure is quite evident. But at the end of it, uh, when she turns back to go home, and the whole idea of going back home is important, she knew not what it was a night or day. So she's lost a sense of spatio-temporal recognition. So her own spatio-temporal embodiment, uh, her own mortal quality, mortal ownership of her own embodiment becomes problematized over here, becomes thwarted over here. Uh, she turned home alone. So the whole idea of going back home is, again, look at the way in which the spatial metaphors uh, play out geographically as well as uh, psychologically. So we just talked about how the market is an unhomely space outside the home. And she comes and becomes a prey of this unhomely, uncanny space by partaking of the fruit in exchange of a sexualized body, in exchange of a sexualized uh, you know, entity, sexualized self. Uh, and in the process, she consumes the fruit. Uh, and you know, by the time she ends consuming the fruit, she, she gets completely uh, you know, defamiliarized and detailized herself in the sense that she doesn't go out. No, it was night or day as she turned home alone. So she, when, she, when she goes back home, when she turns the direction of her home, 
she loses a sense of direction, uh, she loses a sense of day and night, and that becomes the, the beginning of a downfall, that becomes the beginning of a loss of embodiment, a uh, loss of agency over her embodiment, a loss of agency over her own sexualized self. And that's the, that's the part of the poem which we'll explore uh, in the next lecture. So we'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with this in the lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.